Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, I am very privileged to have David Orban as my guest on the show. David Orban, Chief Executive Officer of DotSub, is an entrepreneur and visionary. He was born in Budapest, Hungary, and is on the faculty of and an advisor to Singularity University, where I had the pleasure of meeting him a few months ago. David's personal motto is, what is the question I should be asking? So without further ado, hi, David, and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. It's great to have you here. Hello, Nicola. I am very pleased to be on your show And it might be actually the case that I will end up asking a few questions too, given my motto, right? Absolutely. I was going to say that uh, this is a very strange and unique situation today. And um, in a way, it it shows that we are perhaps uh, a kindred souls, I would say, because we are indeed very much concerned, both of us, with the questions. And if I may also take this opportunity to share with my viewers and listeners today that David Orban is part of the reasons why I got involved in the singularity uh, and blogging in general. Um, and that happened as a result of a few of the interviews that, they, that you did a few years ago. Um, and the one that comes to mind is a very nice short but very nice interview with Werner Vinge. Um, and also uh, I've seen a few of your other presentations and I was very impressed. So you were definitely uh, – after reading Ray Kurzweil's book and watching some of your presentations, I just said, okay, I have to do something about this. So thank you for that, David. You're I am the- honored, and, and, and it is wonderful to hear that. And uh, I hope that uh, as you have been inspired by me, many other people will be inspired by the great uh, job that you are doing because your interview series uh, and your uh, uh, website and blog in general are really beautifully done. I would say much better than I have uh, ever been able to be diligent enough and, and do them myself. Thank you, David. I, I appreciate it, but you're, I think, way too modest. But le- let's just jump into the interview uh, and see where it's going to take us today. So first of all, David, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and especially how, why, and when you got interested in technology. Um, my favorite book at kindergarten was The Adventures of a Carbon Atom. So uh, <laughs> I, I would say that uh, I have been interested in technology since uh, forever, at least since uh, kindergarten. Uh, it is funny because at the time I was in, in Budapest, this was a Hungarian book, but uh, it happens that the book has also been published uh, and translated in, in many other countries. So if you Google the adventures of a carbon atom and you search in Google Books or, or other uh, places, you might actually find it. And uh, since then, of course, uh, through my uh, peripatetic life and, and, and different uh, interests, I really have had the chance to to appreciate how important it is for everybody to realize that what made us move from being uh, one of uh, the millions of uh, species uh, sharing this planet uh, very modestly uh, with with our joys and uh, our tragedies uh, to being uh, really the species that is uh, redesigning the planet and rethinking the future with the potential of actually redesigning and rethinking the universe uh, that has been technology. And a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, They don't realize not only how huge an achievement it has been for the past 10,000 years, but how wonderful of a journey uh, we have the opportunity to go through together if we decide to do so because it is not a predestination. It is not a preconceived necessary path. We have to want it. And if we do not want it, it is not going to happen. So 
let me ask you that. You started incredibly early at kindergarten. Like me, for example, I was almost 30 years old when I discovered the singularity and decided to get involved with it. <laughs> well, I didn't say that I, I discovered singularity in kindergarten. I said I discovered technology in kindergarten. Let's be precise yes, about that. Yes, yes. But uh, let me ask you, so is there any overarching team that connected you from your general interest in technology in general to your particular interest in the singularity specifically? Yes, uh, I um, like people. I like humans both as individuals and as society. I like humanity. And uh, I am convinced that uh, we have incredibly complex challenges ahead of us. So the best way to uh, prepare uh, the largest number possible of individuals and, and groups of individuals, societies, nations, uh, enterprises, to face these challenges uh, is uh, through the analysis that uh, the concept of the technological singularity allows us. So that is really why I, I think it is so important. I love machines. I love AI. That is where I started my professional uh, life as a as a programmer in Lisp and Prolog uh, years ago, he, and and you know I can be misty eyed because I see a beautiful robot, but <laughs> but uh, 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 that doesn't mean that my kinship is uh, uh, is not with with uh, with humanity and my fellow humans, so. Uh, what uh, I care about is to make sure that uh, we maximize the probability of uh, positive, constructive, desirable futures. So would you say that that's the motivation and the overarching team that connects all your ve very varied work uh, together, that is to say uh, bringing forth that very positive outcome, which is by any means not inevitable at all, as you've mentioned, but we have to work very diligently and deliberately in order to accomplish it. Yes, that is, that is uh, I would say, a, a very uh, correct uh, synthesis. And uh, I am also extremely curious and whether I will have the opportunity to participate in the future for another 10 years or 100 years or a million years, I know that I will have an inexhaustible source of wonder and uh, varied adventures uh, ahead of me, uh, thanks to the ingenuity of our species and whatever we are going to become, and thanks also uh, to... Uh, Gödel's uh, theorem, which um, guarantees that uh, we will never stop discovering new uh, wonders, new structures, new surprises around us, both from a theoretical point of view and uh, as, as uh, we apply what we learn in our technology engineering, but also as we explore and discover the world around us. So let me connect this a little bit more with um, the work that you're doing at uh, Singularity University. But before that, perhaps we can trace it through. How did you discover the technological singularity after discovering technology so early? When and how did you discover the concept of the technological singularity, which eventually led you to becoming one of the key figures at Singularity University and member of the advisory board and the faculty there? I um, always uh, wanted to analyze the edges of uh, uh, scientific uh, exploration. Um, I mentioned Gödel's theorem uh, from a mathematical point of view, uh, but also from a philosophical point of view that has always been uh, a, a very dear uh, construct for me, exactly because contrary to uh, the uh, perception of what uh, scientific evolution meant before uh, Gödel's result tells us that uh, we have always new things to, to understand and to discover. Uh, our, uh, our exploration is, is never-ending. 
However, the edges uh, are always there and we can always strive and push against the edges. Uh, and, and another theme is, is fractal self-similarity. So the fact that you, you can trace analogies uh, of, of uh, your life, uh, of, of your youth, of your uh, maturity, of your elder uh, states, and, and, and finally death, with, with other phenomena of, of other living things, but also artificial structures, societies, groups, uh, enterprises, and so on. So as I was uh, trying to understand how our changing uh, premises that start from our basic knowledge of the world around us and our applied knowledge evolve and become more and more complex and, and potentially very powerful, impact or influence this issue of, of uh, self-similarity and, and, and repeating structures. You know, nihil novum sub sole, there is nothing new under the sun, uh, is, is the Latin uh, uh, version of a Greek say. Uh, and I, I, I never felt it would be right. I, I always felt there are always new things under the sun. So the concept of technological singularity for me is the extreme expression of the fact that indeed there are and there going to be not only new things under the sun, but new things that are radically new. Or they are so new that we are not even sure we are going to be well equipped to fully comprehend them. And of course, Ray's book uh, has been just wonderful. Uh, but I have read Ray's previous books as well. Uh, all of them, uh, The Age of... Uh, Spiritual machines uh, and and uh, anything he wrote and and I just loved them. So uh, when um, Singularity University was uh, being designed, I I, I wasn't physically there uh, uh, because I uh, always uh, commute between Europe and and the U.S. Uh, either West Coast or East Coast. Uh, but I could uh, give my input in terms of uh, what I thought uh, uh, would be the right uh, design and the right evolution together with with a core group. That's very interesting. So perhaps now is the time to just nail down a little bit more specifically your take on the definition of the technological singularity. And because one interesting element that comes to mind based on what you just said is the fact that it seems to me that according to you, it is more of a process rather than a single point in time. Definitely. Because it's ongoing rather than a specific point in time. Because my interpretation of Ray's definition is that it is more of a specific point in time, whereas yours sure. is more ongoing. Sure. Um, so um, I believe that um, there are... Um, important changes in, in the way that, that complex structures uh, express uh, their maximum potential. Uh, and so uh, this potential is, is not always the same. And one example of, of, of this difference is how easily a given unit, a given structure, can be introspective and self-aware. The level of introspection and self-awareness that is available to humans 1.0 is, is relatively basic. Uh, whether we strive to achieve that through uh, means of, of, of meditation or uh, via uh, uh, DNA sequencing, uh, in order to access our mental or biological source code, uh, it is a struggle. Uh, as, as a species, it took us many years, you know, whether it is 10,000, 100,000, or a million years that we count as uh, the length of our species, it took us that long to be able and decode our DNA. 
So uh, the forthcoming uh, civilization, whether based on a hybrid human robot, human computer unit, or we allow or, or count into the equation purely uh, robot slash computer units, these are going to have vastly superior capabilities of accessing their source code, their uh, introspection is going to be unparalleled with ours. But it doesn't mean that it will just stop there. They will have their own limitations as well, and they will uh, understand and they will strive to overcome those limitations. And subjectively, from their point of view, whether it will take another 10,000 years or just a week, it is still going to be a similar kind of struggle that we feel. And for them, overcoming their limitations will be as... Uh, it will be the same experience that we are going to go through when we meet our technological singularity. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this. There are two interpretations uh, or uh, most likely outcomes that people believe would occur after such an event. Uh, one of them is the so-called Terminator Matrix scenario, which basically means that the human race either gets extinct or becomes subjugated and enslaved in some way or the interpretation of Ray Kurzweil, which, which is basically we become one with the machines and then we accomplish immortality and sort of intelligence starts disseminating throughout the universe. Uh, for this version, Ray Kurzweil is very often uh, criticized for being way too optimistic, according to some critics. What, in your opinion, is, your, is our chance of surviving the singularity? Um. It is a question of definition. Uh, when I talk with people who want to live uh, long, I totally agree with them. And I want to ling lo live long too and, and explore and experience. But I don't want to live, uh, you know, a hundred years or a few hundred years. I don't want to live a thousand years or a million years. I want to live billions or billions of billions of years. <laughs> However, your laughter makes me think that you realize the absurdity of pretending that as I adapt to changing conditions around me in order to simply exist as a as a as a as an entity, I would be able and look back to what I am and as I am today and honestly say that I am the same. There will necessarily be a point in the future when I will honestly say that I am not the same. And that will be the moment when the individual that is me today will have died. Regardless of material or mental continuity, it is going to be absurd to say that the two entities are the same. So just as this applies to me as an individual, it is going to apply to us as a species as well. Humanity will transform so radically that our grand, grand, grand ch gr children and the civilization that they form would laugh if we said that we are the same. You know, just as it would be um, laughable if the uh, unicellular organisms from which we descend, every cell of yours is dying for the first time after four billion years. Every cell of yours says, I don't want to die. And only if you have children, one of your cells achieves that goal of not dying. All of the others lose out. However, even as they do, what they express is not really the same as the 
on a, a un, unbroken chain of life before them for four billion years is really something so different that if the cell could speak and said, oh, but me four billion years ago and today you, Nicola, we are the same, you would tell the cell, come on, don't be silly. So that is how I see our probability of, of surviving. That is in the long term. In the short term, uh, I am uh, I am naturally brought to be optimistic, and I uh, rationally understand that it is not uh, the 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 most rational stance to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. The most rational stance is to be pessimistic. However, I I am I am driven to be optimistic. And I also think that it is a more constructive uh, position to be in. Mm -hmm. So if I understand you correctly, the key for you is the fact that there is some kind of a continuity between what we are today and what we are going to be. Um, and as long as that there's an unbroken chain of linked, you know, uh, sequence steps, then it we could claim some kind of uh, uh, the fact that it is in a different shape and form us. But the sure, sure, we, we can claim that. And then on, on the other side of the claim, you know, the other thing will say, yes, you're right. Or it will say, come on, don't be silly. Yeah. And, 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 and it will be okay, you know. Mm -hmm. um, however, there is one very important <clears throat> point. Uh, we have experiences of how not to make singularities happen. Uh, we have had, uh, we have induced singularity type experiences uh, in, in many occasions. Uh, and, and these were the moments when we met um, non-technological civilizations or civilizations with, with, with radically different technologies that the Western European originated uh, conquerors um, basically destroyed. Destroyed through um, illnesses, destroyed through um, the um, arms that they brought to, to, to them. Uh, and, and destroyed uh, even more importantly uh, because of how uh, the moral fiber of the goals and the desires of those uh, civilizations uh, was, was destroyed. Uh, when you lose your, your goals, when you lose uh, your aspirations, um, that is the most dangerous moment, and, and that is what we must aim to, to avoid. So, so let me ask you this then. Um, you said about those entities that may continue for almost indefinite period of time. What's your take on death then and life extension technology? Um, absolutely desirable and, and absolutely great. Um, and, and uh, you know, um, how is the universe going to look like in a few thousand years? We really know and understand. So how uh, either uh, uh, the, the, the containers that keep our um, bodies before being uh, revived uh, must be built, or how our new bodies have to be designed uh, once we are revived can be can be a, a, a doable engineering uh, proposition. However, uh, if uh, we think about uh, the way the universe might look like, even in in, in our corner, in in longer time periods, then it is going to be a larger challenge, and so we have to do it step by step. Uh, and what do you think uh, such advanced technologies such as life extension technologies and anything else, what kind of impact would these ones have on our take on religion, for example, as a society and personally, in personal um, 
Well, my 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 take on on, on religion is is uh, fairly fairly radical. Uh, I define myself as a missionary atheist. Uh, I uh, am very eager to um, educate people to a level where they uh, renounce the crutches of religion and they liberate their minds from the dogmatic stance which uh, stops them from fully uh, enjoying what the wonders of the world are uh, which do not come from uh, books uh, assembled a few thousand years ago but really uh, flourish through billions of different uh, uh, physical laws interacting in, in, in wonderful combinations. And exploring those and understanding the universe is, is much uh, uh, more beautiful than uh, the, the modest and, and uh, somewhat ridiculous aims uh, uh, that, that the various religions uh, give themselves. You know, this, this doesn't surprise me because uh, I feel exactly the same way as you and perhaps because we are too inquisitive and we tend to ask too many questions. And as we know, uh, in religion, I actually had a discussion recently with a friend of mine and I said, well, in religion, everything starts with faith. In science, I believe, and, and, and in philosophy, everything starts with doubt. Everything starts with a question, right? So yeah. they're almost the antithesis of each other, right? The scientific method, philosophy, the love of wisdom, and, and religion, they're starting from diametrically opposed points of view. And, and if you're starting with, like, what is the question that I should be asking, then I can see how naturally everything flows from there. Yeah, and, and, and I am um, a little bit uh, offended and a little bit uh, uh, saddened by uh, those who attempt... Uh, to uh, force uh, coherent worldviews and 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 attitudes when they think that that science and religion can be uh, peacefully uh, coexisting, uh, I, I think that their struggle, uh, which must be continuous and and self-imposed, uh, masochistically really. To, to maintain uh, an honest outlook uh, is, is, uh, is, is useless. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that way, and it is not that way for those who, who release themselves from the shackles of, uh, of dogmatism. Let me ask you this, though, because I recently read uh, Sonia Arison's book, uh, 100 Plus, and I interviewed her for, the, uh, for this podcast, too. And one of the interesting things that um, made me think a lot about uh, after reading her book is the fact that according to her, and it was also a, a counterintuitive uh, discovery based after a lot of research for herself too, was that um, in her opinion, religion is likely to get more popular as we tend to live longer lives and as we have more leisure because... Uh, we would have higher rather than lower interest in spiritual pursuits such as religion, and we would have more time to devote to it rather yes. than less. So it's, let, it me, was... let me give, let me give an, a, a, an interpretation to this phenomenon, uh, which, as you say, uh, would look counterintuitive to people like us. Uh, religions are very good at survival and they had thousands of years to meet and overcome challenges to their continuity. Uh, so they keep adapting and they keep um, uh, they, uh, they, they colonize the minds of the vulnerable uh, by giving them tasks that uh, dress themselves as useful. Um, and uh, basically that is what is happening. Religious organizations 
are very good at using modern technology of using web uh, uh, sites and podcasts and uh, translating uh, texts in uh, hundreds or actually thousands of, of languages, uh, evangelizing and popularizing their positions. So people who have a lot of time and who are not educated to find better things with, to do with their time are going to find an infinite number of activities uh, that per definition will be called good and fruitful activities because that is the way they will be termed by the religion itself. Um, so the way to stop this, uh, which as I see it is, 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 a, is a wasteful and vicious uh, circle, is through more education and more understanding and and uh, separating uh, religious from the spiritual uh, and and religious from the moral you can be spiritual and you can be moral without being religious you can do good you can devote yourself to the benefit of of others and of humanity without being religious so it is a challenge if you wish to secular organizations to secular foundations to secular goals and, and, and uh, tasks to make sure that uh, this immense potential of human desire to do good is, is used um, in, in manners that are um, less wasteful. Let me move on to another uh, topic which I know you're also an expert in and which is very near and dear to your work, and that's uh, the Internet of Things. Um, so let me start with this. What is the Internet of Things? The Internet is a network of networks uh, that um, is extremely resilient and adaptable and rich, uh, but it is based on a, on a series of uh, uh, very well-designed protocols that enable various computers to communicate uh, with each other. So the Internet of Things is also a network of networks. Instead of having traditional computers as nodes, it can have anything as nodes of these networks of networks. Why would anything be connected to this uh, new type of network? Well, uh, there are many reasons, both technological and economical and uh, uh, even reasons of, of design and, and usability. Uh, as computers become uh, more and more miniaturized, they reach a point, and they have just reached it, where their fundamental design principles have to change. Uh, currently, we have incredibly powerful computers in our pockets, uh, we call them mobile phones, but they are uh, just universal computers. And this is the last generation of, of these units that can uh, be thought of as, as they have been thought of for, for many decades. Because in the next generation, after having been billions around us, there will be tens of billions, then hundreds of billions, then thousands of billions. And, and we, humans are not going to be able to, and we are not going to want to care for them as we are doing today. When you are required to back up your hard disk, or uh, clean up your registry, or uh, disinfect your computer with an antivirus, uh, or make sure that all your uh, text messages are read, uh, or your voicemail box is clean, you are enslaved to the computer and, and, and you don't want to, to do that. You are forced to do that today, but you are doing nothing productive. So it is not only not going to be possible because if you do that very, uh, you know, you are not happy about it, but you do it with your personal computer and maybe with your 
uh, phone and uh, you uh, download the photos from your digital camera to your computer, which is your digital camera is a, is a computer too. Well, when you are going to have hundreds or thousands of objects around you, you, you don't want to do it. So these units will have to communicate, configure, manage, and even deploy and replace themselves completely by their own. They will have to be autonomous, and they will have to be aware of the environment, whether they are in a useful place and whether they are actually doing useful tasks or they should be someplace else whether their internal state allows them to do a useful task or they are broken. And so they have to be able to perceive the environment, but they have to be also introspective to perceive themselves. An important element is that if today we can afford our computers to be more or less um, friendly to us, but certainly unfriendly to the environment, in a future with the Internet of Things, we will have to design not only units that are autonomous, introspective, aware of the environment, but they will have to be ecologically sound. Even more, they will have to be biocompatible because, as Ray says, we are going to have billions of them inside of our own bodies and uh, they, they will have just to be designed so that they can live both in the natural environment and uh, where, where um, in, in, in our bodies as, as they are today. So, it is quite fascinating that uh, companies like Intel and Cisco and many others have uh, roadmaps that uh, they are uh, very uh, reliably walking on engineering-wise to step-by-step um, -step design elements of the forthcoming Internet of Things. Yeah, and I remember during our time, my time at Singularity University and during the visits at uh, both uh, at Cisco, for example, they were giving us number like 50 billion in only two or three years, and then I've heard numbers like 7 trillion from the Intel roadmap. Correct. And so on. But let me ask you this the imp about the implication of such a powerful technology. Um, the issue is this. You have such smart, almost omnipresent trillions of sensors, uh, such as the Internet of Things. And the question then is, would such technology play a positive role in liberating humanity and making it live better, longer, and more comfortable lives in a safer environment? Or would it enslave humanity and create the potential for Big Brother either in the face of another member of our own race, like a dictator, or a machine potentially uh, mm -hmm. taking over that role? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the answer is both. Uh, it, it has the potential to be both, and it is not going to be the same all over the planet. So it is likely, concretely, to be both depending on where you are especially within the next few years. Then going farther out in the future, I think that society will change so much. It'll already it is changing, uh, really, that, uh, that uh, what it means to be uh, private, what it means to be public, what uh, levels of transparency are um, accepted or required uh, are going to shift uh, radically. Once again, I am an optimist. So my answer is that the Internet of Things is going to free humanity. Actually, it is what is going to make us human again. Because 
when we are enslaved in processes, and whether these are mechanical processes or, or, or even something as natural as agriculture, uh, we are less than few, fully, fully human. We, we, we have to adapt and we have to force ourselves to follow a discipline and to follow very harsh conditions that actually made for thousands of years uh, the lives of humans worse than the lives, admittedly shorter, but freer of hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers uh, did not uh, work a lot. They hunted or gathered, and then they did nothing. And yes, they were also free to die when they were 20 or 25 years old, which, which probably wasn't fun, but they didn't have an alternative then. And so after the switch to an agricultural society, it was actually quite worse. You, you, you had to work longer hours, and, and, and we are still in the same situation. We are not breaking our bre uh, backs anymore. And, and uh, uh, you know, if, if we told uh, our um, uh, cousins from 50 or 100 years ago uh, that uh, by being at our computers and having fun, just learning things all day and producing uh, information and culture and connecting through continents, that is our work, well, they would be delighted uh, to, to have a work uh, like that. So this is going to, to progress even further. Uh, a lot of types of works that, that today we, we do and we are even proud of are going to be automated. Uh, blue collar work has been automated and now white collar work is, is being automated as well. The next uh, category of work that is going to be automated is creative work. And after automating blue collar, white collar and creative work, it is going to be very, very hard for a lot of people to, to, to feel that they are worth something to humanity, that they have an impact, that they matter. And that is where I think it is so important that we concentrate and we enhance and we educate people to understand that human to human communication and the value of one human to another is uh, going to be enhanced and it is where they should invest their attention and their capabilities and their education uh, because uh, everything else is going to be taken uh, by the machines. Very interesting. So, as a side note, by the way, I would like to recommend to our viewers today that uh, your uh, very uh, interesting uh, presentation at TEDx in Brussels, which covers uh, a lot of that topic. Uh, but um, let me push you a little bit further on that point here, specifically about the role of humanity and humans in future society. Uh, and um, the criticism that comes from people such as Ted Kaczynski, for example, is that um, technology is becoming more and more in charge. As you say, uh, first it was blue-collar uh, work, then white-collar work, then eventually creative work. Well, Ted Kaczynski says that eventually what happens is then the machines evac uh, effectively are in charge of our human society and are in fact therefore running it and setting its direction even, right? Once the creativity is outsourced. And for him, therefore, that was the end of us as a rational, self-determining species. And that's, that's the future that he supposedly fought with his uh, bombs and stuff like that. But sure. looking at it from a philosophical point of view and sticking to his uh, philosophical argument, what do you say to that kind of a reason? Or argument. Okay, so um, um, you know the answers that that he gave and the the conclusions that he arrived at uh, are um, you know demonstratedly self-defeating. Um, 
he is today not contributing to the conversation anymore. I don't know whether he would have had new useful answers to give, but he decided to remove himself from uh, even contemplating this possibility by his own actions. So that is a freedom, I hope, without the use of, of terrorism and without the use of, of arms and without killing anybody, but the freedom of not participating in the future uh, is an important freedom to uh, leave to everybody. Uh, it is going to be extremely important and it will be a proud moment when we will be able to design a society that it is not going to force people to adopt certain technological tools if they don't want to. And, and the excess energy and the excess complexity that society will have to keep in order to respect those rights uh, is going to be considerable. So if we achieve that, uh, that is going to be to be uh, a worthy goal to work towards. To say that any individual human today is completely free to determine his or her life is 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 an illusion. Um, we are already uh, delegating and 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 de demanding uh, so much. Uh, to other structures and from other structures that support us, that it doesn't matter whether those structures are um, run by machines that are composed of humans or are run by machines, in an, and I define machines here in an abstract manner, processes that are run, that are composed by, by non-human elements. It makes no difference. I, I have no idea where the food that I eat every day come, is coming from. And, and if we were aiming to restore a society that we think is ideal, uh, that would have this feature of us always being in total control of where our food or our shelter or our energy or, or everything else transportation is coming from, well, we are actually talking about hunter-gatherer society, and then and, and that's okay as long as we are ready to decide who are the 999,998 people to die because civilization cannot support 7 billion people. It can only support probably 15 or 20 million people on the planet in a hunter-gatherer society. Mm -hmm. So I am not ready to say who should die. Actually, I want many more people to live. And that is why I am ready to keep building this very complex structure where we are delegating a lot of things to others and we are demanding a lot of services to others. And if these others are machines that do a better job than my fellow humans, I will be more than happy to give that task to, to machines. You know, I would feel safer for my children to be driven to school on a robotic bus than I feel with a human driver. Mm -hmm. So, So let me... I think that connects very well with your previous point about the, the primacy of human-centered communication and human-to-human -human interaction because that perhaps would be the key of the peaceful coexistence between the, the advanced, technologically advanced majority and perhaps some smaller minorities such as, for example, the Amish who would choose to opt out of, of those, uh, you know, Benefits sure. of technology or benefits from our point of view. Or, or, or very simply, take a longer term to analyze the pros and cons of, of things. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. Amish use phones, but they don't keep phones in their pockets. The phone is at the outskirts of the village, yeah. and it is used in emergencies. But they don't rely on phones 
to talk to their neighbors. Yeah. To, they just walk to their neighbors and, and talk to their neighbors. Mm -hmm. so, so it is a, 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 a very mature consideration of how technology, technology should be introduced in, in society. Mm -hmm. So human-centered uh, communication uh, is, is uh, it, it, it can be a lot of things, and, and it, it can be technology uh, mediated by technology. Uh, it can be dancing, it can be learning another language, it can be teaching uh, to, to do, uh, you know, crafts or, or, or arts. It can even be reality television. Uh, it can be anything that connects one person to another or to, uh, to groups and one group to, to another. Um, at at dot sub where I'm, I'm, I'm CEO, what we do is to eliminate uh, the, the language barrier to online communication through video. And it is actually very interesting. I recently, you know, built this, uh, this uh, hypothesis of why video is uh, so popular as uh, a communication tool online. And the answer that I gave myself it is because computers are still not very good at creating video spam. Mm -hmm. Computers are starting to be pretty good at manipulating text in a manner that um, we fall prey of and then we are made to do whatever uh, you know, the creators of those uh, spam uh, uh, messages programmed their computers to ask us to do, uh, so much so that we started trusting text on the web a little bit less than we used to because we know that it is not always sure what is on the other side. Is it the human writing this or is it the computer regurgitating something that a human maybe has written uh, three or four times removed uh, from from where we are today. However, when you are watching a, a, a video blog or you are watching a, a speech at a conference or you are watching a music video or you are watching whatever is the video content, you can be still today and for a few years still you can be sure that either it is absolutely human generated or if it is computer generated, it was so expensive that it is not automated. You know, if you are James Cameron, you can do very convincing computer generated video. Yeah. Uh, but for a few years, still, our personal computers or phones are not going to be in that supercomputer class which will generate in real time non-human avatars at a convincing level. So that is why video is exploding because it is the more honest, most honest and, and, and with the highest emotional bandwidth uh, communication channel that we have available. Mm -hmm. And you think you're saying that at least in the near future that is likely to remain so? Yes, yeah. and and investing in that, you know, both on the personal level or the interpersonal level, but even on the brand level at the enterprises, organizations, in political speech, investing in online video is the right way to connect to other other humans. And it is happening, you know, whether it is the TED conferences, whether it is Adobe Television, whether it is... Uh, Osho with his uh, spiritual teachings, itself. this podcast itself, yeah. Stanford University with its AI class. Yeah. These are all examples that I gave that not only use video at uh, their uh, most uh, uh, advanced uh, possibilities, but they are also using .sub to make the videos discoverable because computers still cannot index uh, the videos by their content. They only index them by their uh, metadata, titles, and descriptions. Make the videos accessible to other people uh, who don't speak the source language of, of the video. And, and 
make sure that the videos reach their maximum potential in the various geographical niches that would not be achieved other other uh, otherwise mm-hmm. uh, so so th- these are extremely fascinating uh, real time experiences and experiments in in what i think uh, is going to be a dominating theme in in the future david uh, time is advancing here so i would try to uh, sort of cram in the last three or four questions here within the na- the next 10 minutes or so so let me ask you a little bit of a different question. I recently uh, read a trilogy, science fiction trilogy called the WWW series, uh, Wake, Watch, and Wonder, written by a Canadian science fiction uh, uh, writer called Robert J. Sawyer, who is also the, the writer behind the Flash Forward TV series. And uh, in, these, in this trilogy, he is... Uh, exploring the potential of an emergence of a virtual artificial intelligence over the Internet. The argument goes along the lines that all those nodes uh, between the Internet of Things or our computers or whatever it may be are currently approaching, if they have not already surpassed it, the number of neural neural, uh, nodes that we have in our brains. And the idea goes that after it reaches a certain point of saturation, perhaps there would be a new intelligence emerging on the Internet. What do you think of that as a possibility? What's your take on it as an expert on the Internet of Things? How likely or unlikely is this? Uh, I actually gave a talk at the um, uh, Artificial General Intelligence uh, Conference of uh, 2010 in Lugano, Switzerland, uh, which was entitled... Uh, symbiotic AGI is one planet enough. Uh, where uh, what I what I said was very um, similar to to this concept of uh, uh, our uh, emerging um, self-aware uh, systems that we would endow with uh, all the the thinking qualities projecting them into it that we also feel we possess uh, would not be necessarily uh, in, in, a, in a single computer in the basement, but would be expressed by a very large structure. Um, and this also stems from, uh, from uh, uh, the view, which, which is very well expressed by Eliezer Yutkovsky, in, in his uh, presentations, that uh, once we have more than one type of intelligence, as, as we know today, only one, we won't stop at two. We will have thousands and millions and billions of different types of intelligences. So we might have AI in a box in the basement, but we will certainly have other types, and one of these types could be um, living in a vast network of uh, uh, the Internet of Things. However, it is going to be very different from uh, what we are. One of the reasons is in the laws of physics. Uh, Our brain can uh, create a coherent um, self-image because it is small. And whether chemical or electric signals are traveling uh, in in its various parts, uh, they don't take too long to, um, uh, you know, uh, synchronize the different parts. Mm -hmm. Already we have to play a little bit of games uh, with ourselves, censoring some of uh, our perceptions uh, to pretend that everything is occurring at the same time and we are seeing and we are thinking and we are acting coherently which is not at all true. We are just fooling ourselves. However, if a single identity were uh, to be on a scale of an entire continent or an entire planet, or even extending, I don't know, to low Earth orbit or geostationary orbit or, or to the moon, why not? Then it would have to be radically different because even at light speed, it couldn't create quickly enough a coherent self-image. Mm-hmm. So it would naturally break down 
into complementary thinking subunits and would then if 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 those subunits wouldn't be intelligent enough on their own it would have to find its way of thinking about itself which would be very different from the way that we think about ourselves and our identity today mm -hmm. so you have such a broad knowledge about so many fields and you're sort of cutting across through so many disciplines so let me ask you in your own words who is david orban are you an entrepreneur a futurist, a singularitarian, a technology enthusiast, a scientist, a teacher? Sure. Well, uh, I am uh, a, a, a curious, evolving being that uh, is striving uh, to keep the right balance between being immodest which I think is an important quality that everybody should have, which tells you, you can try. It doesn't guarantee that you can succeed, that you will succeed, but you tell yourself, you can try. You shouldn't refrain from trying. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, keeping the balance in being um, humble. Because when you are unhumble, what you are telling yourself that you are the only one. Everybody else is is either incapable or, or not up to the task and, and you are the only one. So I am trying to keep the right balance between these two. The tragedy is when and and I feel lucky uh, not to be in that, that category because it is it is really uh, uh, something that 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 uh, is hardly constructive more likely to be destructive the tragedy that there are people who are right to be unhumble who are really the only ones who can achieve something who can do something um and 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 those are incredibly powerful individuals who live uh, very unique lives and and um I don't envy their challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am, I am quite uh, happy with the continued tension and the challenges of, of my currently normal and human life, uh, and, and uh, I am just uh, enjoying it a lot. Excellent. So where can our viewers find more information about you and your work? Um, as of this recording, uh, in November 2011, uh, the most uh, uh, popular search engine is called Google. <laughs> so my recommendation is uh, if you are watching this and you are still close to the date of the recording, to put David Space Orban in Google and you will find a lot of things and unfortunately for the several other people who are called with the same identifier uh, I uh, basically uh, conquered the space so so they 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 don't show up or very very uh, hardly show up if you are watching this uh, in uh, what we would call the year 3000 or 3 million or 3 billion uh, then uh, we used to say your mileage may vary and this wouldn't be helpful to you because you wouldn't have an idea what this saying actually means so don't worry just have a laugh and probably you don't even very much care but I still think that you had fun watching this recording from whatever incredible future uh, you are living today I know I enjoyed this immensely so the last question that I have to you is do you have a single message, both either for us today or for those who would watch this in the year 3 million, as you said, that you would like them to take away from this interview today? Um, curiosity, I, I think, is, is just great. It is playfulness. It is uh, questioning your own positions, your assumptions, 
uh, that is where my motto starts from. So yes, uh, my, my message uh, remains as uh, we started. Uh, keep asking questions, uh, look for interesting questions, sort them, and, and find the ones that inspire you the most. And those will de be the seeds of, of uh, incredible paths of uh, exploration and, and knowledge that you will be able and go through. David Torben, thank you very much for being on Singularity One-on-One -on -one today. Thank you.